Hi, everybody, and welcome back to our podcast from the Kama Sutra to 2020, where we look at your questions, your concerns, even your worries around all things to do with sex and sexuality. So as always, we have with us Dr. Anvita Madan Behel. Anvita is a psychosexual therapist and she brings the psychological perspective to the advice that the Kama Sutra has to give. Welcome, Anvita. Thank you, Seema, and welcome to our vlog this week. So, um, Anvita, today I want to touch upon a subject that has suddenly come up in a very big way again, which is performance anxiety. I find it's interesting. I mean, performance anxiety has always been there with people. I mean, we've always had questions about, am I too small? Am I too big? Do I look like this? Do I, you know, but suddenly I think post lockdown, especially in certain places like in India where things have opened up, people are meeting again for so many months of lockdown where you weren't seeing anybody face to face and you were sexting and you had that um, screen to hide behind. Suddenly you're back physically, you have that intimacy, you're, you're back um, in the proximity, you're face to face and all of these fears have come back and actually they've redoubled because from months of not having to deal with it, suddenly we're dealing with it again. Absolutely. And I think your abs- the performance anxiety actually has, be- has been the biggest drivers for most sexual problems and it has been there forever. But there is an element that people were exchanging, um, you know, conversations and otherwise behind the screen and they hadn't met people for seven months so you could come up with the persona or you could be more liberated or have less inhibitions because you knew that you were not meeting in person and now suddenly you have to convert everything that somewhat you had shared in live and that can cause a lot of stress or anxiety. Yeah, so um, the first question that I want to bring up is from this young boy who says that um, he's a senior at school, so he's about 19. He's um, very athletic, tall. He's the captain of the football team. So he's got everything going for him. And he was say, he says that he has a high sexual drive, that um, he's easily excitable. He watches a lot of pornography, but he'd never actually had sex before. And just to learn a little bit or to give himself some experience, he decided to visit a prostitute. So he did go. And he said that for some reason, he went there and his brain just seized up. And he had so much anxiety that he couldn't even get an erection. And he came away feeling really awful about himself. He came away feeling like, oh my God, will I ever be able to do it? Am I shit at this? What happened? And he's really, really distressed. And and this is a very common problem. What I want to say is that it is, and and of course, he had lots going around it, but people come in really struggling, like they might not get an erection or that they have these expectations and somebody who is popular and has this physique, there's an aura around, you know, there are these ideas that you need to be a really good lover. And if you're seeing porn, you have an expectation that your performance needs to be like porn stars. We have said it multiple times on our podcast that porn is made out of software, there's editing, there's everything. But the image, the expectations that are there for especially young people is that I need to be a certain way, that there is something known as a really good lover or a perfect lover. There's something known as a good body or I need to perform. Yeah, and there's standards. And the question we always ask is, who made these rules? Where are these standards? Who decided these standards? But what happens is that you go with all that pressure and anxiety and expectations. You know, just the way somebody would say in the exam, you must get 95%. It's similar. And who, like, what is that 95%? You know, you have no idea what that 95% is. So when you go in 
and you want to have a sexual experience, you're worrying about what those criteria are and if you're meeting those criteria rather than actually enjoying or having fun or engaging. Like the engagement stops because in your head, you're saying, am I doing this right? Am I looking okay? Have I put this right? Have I done this right? Have I kissed properly? Have I touched properly? So you're worrying what we call spectatoring. You're worrying more about your performance than actually engaging in the intimacy or the sexual experience with the other person. You know, I like what you said about this this criteria, the standard that you have to meet about uh, you look a certain way and you've got this cool persona, so you have to be a good lover. And I just want to say this, and I'm probably going to have to say it again and again many times. The Kama Sutra doesn't say that you become a good lover. It says you have to be a desirable lover, which is a huge difference, which means that how you come across to the other person makes you more desirable. It's something that makes somebody want to be with you. But there isn't like a flag that you get, you know, like I finished this milestone and hence I give myself a gold star. So there isn't any such thing as a good lover because everybody's needs are different. Exactly. And we've once again, you know, the, the idea is that if you're a desirable lover, in some ways what I hear is, you're somebody who is into intimacy, you're listening to what your partner wants, or you're, you know, you're noticing what excites your partner or doesn't excite your partner, or you're actually paying attention to yourself and your partner. And that's what makes you desirable. Like somebody, you are somebody who's interested in the other person and the other person is interested in you. And that changes from partner to partner. Um, so there isn't a blanket I'm a good lover and exactly what you're saying, because what works with one partner doesn't work with the other one. You know, somebody might, might love their years being bitten and somebody else might think it's the most disgusting thing to happen. So there isn't a criteria. And to make yourself desirable, you need to be able to connect with the partner that you have. Um, so, yeah. So I just want to also say that, um, you know, a lot of young people, particularly young men, but generally young people will go to sex workers in the initial stages of their sexual explorations. And it's not an unusual thing. It's not a new thing. It's something that a lot of people do, but there's a lot of guilt around going to a sex worker. You know, I've even had people in the past saying that, okay, you know, we went to the sex worker because, you know, we were, we were on a high, we really wanted to experiment. And, you know, there, there's a lot of excitement about going. But by the time we came back, we were stone cold sober and feeling not very good about ourselves. And I think that comes from two things. One is the reality of a sex worker's life. It isn't glamorous and beautiful and exciting as we imagine this whole scenario to be. And I think that reality hits you to begin with. And I think that the other thing is just the guilt that then comes with it. Mm -hmm. And I think that has a huge impact on performance. But I, and I, I, I think I'd like to really say this, Anvita, and I'd love your um, advice on this as well, that there are institutions with sex workers. It isn't an ideal place. Nobody says that that's an ideal life, but they're there. And they do fulfill a certain need. So if you don't have a partner, if you wish to experiment, if you want to try something out, instead of getting aggressive or letting that actually build up inside you to something worse. There is an outlet over here. Well, you know, there are a lot of politics around sex workers and everything. And a lot of researchers now work to support them and uh, organizations uh, because it is an exploited life and it's a tough life. And, um, and you know, their health and the violence that they might face is quite significant. Uh, but as in, we're talking about performance anxiety, so I will not go into the politics of it. But the reality is that if you've chosen to go to a sex worker, um, 
and I will empathize with young men because once again, they have the burden and the pressure of you need to be this good lover or you need to know how to have sex and what and where do they learn you know there is no sex education nobody is teaching them nothing's happening um so sometimes they learn the ropes from sex workers because that's where they can go and they can you know and so once again but obviously that's not a relationship there is an intimacy it is pure sex uh, and that's why and it's an interaction it's a transaction in some ways at the end of the day you're paying for sex so that experience will feel different because it's a transaction. It's not coming out of a relationship where there's intimacy and trust and you have a relationship and you're doing it. And so transactional sex, which happens in non-paying partner as well, it's common amongst people now to have friends with benefits. So that's transactional sex, uh, which will feel different. But if that's the need of the hour and that's what you're looking for, that's your choice. Um, so don't, like accept that that's what you engaged in because that's what you were interested in in the moment rather than feeling guilty about it. But at, at any point, if transactional sex is actually coming in the way of you having healthy relationships or you're unable to have relationships, then maybe you need to pay attention to it. If not, like you're saying, it's a sexual need and uh, you decided to fulfill it uh, and it's consensual. So it's actually better to have cons consensual transactional sex than you know, forcing or coercing someone to have sex with you when they're not interested. Yeah, I think um, that's a hugely valid point. And I do hope that people do take that away because I know that most young men will come away with a sense of real guilt from this, but if it is consensual, if it is the need of the moment, then don't let guilt overtake you. There are different ways of dealing with certain things. Okay, also from a lot of young women, performance anxiety problems based around the fact that when they're with their partners, they love the foreplay. It makes them really wet. Everything is going great. But the moment it comes to the actual sex, they get really distressed about it. They become more dry, it becomes more painful, they're backing off, and this is starting to impact them. Any number of women. Yeah, so I'm going to answer that question in a couple of parts, because I think part of it is um, when it comes to penetrative sex, sex, morality kicks in, because people think like kissing, touching, like all other bases is okay, uh, but they remain a virgin until penetrative sex happens. So somewhere they feel like all this is okay, but not the penetration in some way. So I think there's an element of that being present uh, and they get nervous about it and they don't know how to negotiate that. They don't know how to pre-negotiate saying, I only want to have foreplay. I don't want penetrative sex. Um, and they feel pressured into giving up into it uh, and they might not want to. And the other aspect also is that I think a lot of women have now feel that there are expectations from them of being a good lover as well. Like they need to have a certain performance sexually so they might need feel like they have to have an orgasm they need to come they need to be other things and once again that's not true for every person that's not true for every woman uh, but they 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 also feel that they are those criteria and standards for them and they feel very nervous that once somebody in some ways, if you think about it, when penetration happens, you lose control. You don't have control over the situation and you might or might not orgasm. And they feel very nervous that if it doesn't happen, then they would not be good enough lovers or people, their partner wouldn't feel satisfied in some ways. So once again, there's a lot of anxiety for them as well. You know, um, I wanted to actually tell you about a couple of our ancient text. So in one of our Shastras, one of our Kam Shastras, it actually says that for a woman, the foreplay is where uh, she's extremely close to her lover. So she absolutely loves it. A woman loves that part of it because she's being touched, she's being hugged. 
the moment penetration has to begin, he has to draw back mm -hmm. in order to penetrate. And the breaking of that contact is very distressing for most women, so they don't like it. The other interesting thing is that in the ancient Chinese erotica, I've always said that Indian erotica doesn't deal with the act of penetration. It doesn't deal with all the thrusting and things. You know, it's all very sort of beautiful and elegant. Ancient Chinese erotica had this thing about, um, they actually set standards. So they would say that if you are a really good lover, then you should be able to thrust 4,000 times before you come or 5,000 times before you come. And, and then they would put the same thing on the woman that a woman who gets tired after 200 thrusts is not a good lover. So I think that somewhere these things have come down to us. And I just think that that's a hell of a, uh, it's a, it's a, hell of a, a burden to carry to think that, you know, that's what you're actually aiming for. Now, I don't think that a lot of our audiences would have read those texts, so they're aware of these numbers. So I don't think that's necessarily what's bothering them. I'm just using that as, that as an example. But I think that this idea of thrusting is what puts a lot of women off because, you know, after a little while, it's it becomes monotonous, it becomes boring, it becomes unexciting. And we know that that's going to happen. So you start to back off from the beginning. Yeah, and, and, and like we're saying, like, it's interesting that the Chinese actually had a criteria of yeah. what it makes it or not, uh, but that's missing, as in we don't know what it is. And, and I would say somewhere we have learned that one formula doesn't work for everyone. Um, and so you adapt or you might do certain things, like partners learn that when I do X, Y, or Z, my partner gets very excited and tends to orgasm at that time. Could be for male or female. Like they know what helps bring climax. But that is something that you observe and learn with your partner. It, it, it cannot, it will not work each time. And I can guarantee you that, that you can't, like people say, oh, he can make you do this. No, that is just a myth that you're perpetuating. That is not true. And that's true for women as well. Um, and, you know, we would love to do maybe a video on orgasm because it is not something that most women can have easily, especially penetrative orgasm. Clitoral orgasms are easier. Penetrative orgasms are very difficult. Um, and these days, the pressure that both men and women feel to make sure that a woman gets a penetrative orgasm is so high and so problematic that it causes a lot of stress, anxiety uh, for them and a lot of problems then. And um, one of the things that performance anxiety is based around, of course, is size. Hmm. Yeah, and so once again, like, you know, th there are all these myths around the sizes of the penis and that there is an ideal size or somebody feels like I'm too big, will I hurt my partner? I'm too small, I won't. And you know, there are, size does not matter. We know this, uh, it doesn't matter. The vagina is a muscle, it expands or contracts, it fits in. Like you can still have sex with your partner the size doesn't matter, but, you know, and, and, and pornography is a problem because they show a certain size of a penis or they see or their ideas around it, which are once again manufactured, like those are, they use, they use different models for different parts of the body. Uh, and they might use somebody else's hand and somebody else's leg and somebody else's penis and get it all together. And, and so they perpetuate these myths, but they are myths. Uh, size does not matter. And you shouldn't and, feel anxious about it. And if that is where your anxiety is about size, then I have to say that this is what the positions of the Kama Sutra were created for, to help you to bring your sizes in sync with each other. So 
if you are too small and the woman is too big, then the ideal position would be where the woman would uh, bring her legs together or draw her knees in, things that would actually help her to contract herself. Then there is um, ways of actually positioning your body in such a way that you can penetrate more deeply and so on. So there are lots of different things that we can do. But of course, that's that initial thing to worry about. But a lot of men have this thing about that they are just not the, the perfect size. And as we've said, there is no such thing as the, the perfect size. And actually, as a couple, you would have to see what position works with you, focusing on what is giving you pleasure, right? So, you know, Seema just mentioned certain positions, try different positions, and you would understand that, oh, this gives me most pleasure as a woman or a man. And it might be different for you and a partner. So once again, this performance anxiety of we both need to orgasm at the same time and it will happen doesn't exist as it, it obviously happens at time. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but a lot of time it might mean that you're getting your partner to orgasm or giving her a clitoral orgasm and then penetrating and having an orgasm. There are multiple combinations. You might, one position might work for the woman and another position might work for the man and you would switch positions because it gives more pleasure to each of the partners. Uh, so once again, these ideas of like what that perfect sexual act is doesn't exist. It's going to be yours and yours only with your partner. And that is the combination that you need to work towards. And of course, orgasm is not the be all and end all. You can happily have sex without both partners orgasming or only one partner orgasm, uh, orgasming or both coming together or whatever. It's the variety is all there. Yeah. And, and a lot of women actually might not want the pressure of the orgasm. They're just happy with the foreplay and the intimacy and the, and they just actually, sometimes the orgasm actually adds the pressure. So when we give exercises, we might actually say penetration is off limits. You know, you can only engage in foreplay and oral or just the touching, you know, the penetration is off limit. And so many people come back saying we finally could like enjoy each other because the pressure of penetration wasn't there. So the other pressures of like having an erection, being able to insert a penis to have an like the, none of the pressures were there and they actually could you know, enjoy being with their partner and have intimacy and enjoy the sexual experience. And I think what I would like to add to this is that there isn't just one way to have sex, which means that there isn't just one emotion that you're expected to have with sex. There's a very famous book called The Amaru Shatak, where, um, which basically deals with 1000 different emotions during sex. So each time you have sex, you can feel differently, you come differently, you act differently. So you can be wild one day, you can be calm one day, you can be almost sleepy one day, you can feel musical one day. It's every day is a different thing. There isn't a criteria that, okay, we've gotten together and this is what we've got to actually, you know, like it's a race to the finish, you've got to get to this point. So if your performance anxiety is based around this idea of you reaching a certain bar. That's not you the bar it. for that day. Yeah, that's not the yes. bar. Yeah, there, as there's it, a I, thousand different ways. You miss the point if you're making sex a race to get to orgasm. You've missed the point completely. I totally agree um, that you really, as in, and then you made it a formula. So, what's the fun in it in some ways. So yeah, absolutely. And I think that uh, we started off this thing about how a lot of people feel guilt. And once again, Anvita and I've said this many times that sex should be about joyousness. I know that in society outside, we associate it with sin, we associate it with guilt, but while you're actually having sex, if you're lucky enough, 
to actually be with somebody that you really want to be with and it's consensual and you're having sex. Put aside those societal notions for a little while and give yourself the permission to enjoy it. So for a little while, put aside the guilt and just give yourself over to it and just see what happens. Being present. So we speak a lot about mindfulness and being present in the act rather than being outside and looking in and saying, you know, am I doing this right? Am I doing that right? Rather than looking at your performance, just be with your partner and be present, you know. So mindfulness and being present is way more important than actually judging yourself uh, and giving yourself marks on what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong. Yeah, your gold star sheet. Mm -hmm. so, so I think um, to wrap that up uh, from everything that Anvita said um, and what the Kama Sutra suggests is that there's no such thing as a good lover or a perfect lover. What you're aiming is to be a desirable lover because that automatically means that somebody wants to be with you and that you are trying very hard to make that a great experience. The second is that if you are feeling guilty about it, taking on all those notions, if you've chosen to have sex, then for that time, and if it's consensual for that time, drop the idea of the guilt, be mindful, be present, enjoy it. If you are choosing to visit a sex worker, and it is something that you wish to do, or it's a need for whatever reason, then don't keep feeling guilty about what you've done. You've chosen to do it. It was a need. Go with that. Don't, don't judge yourself and beat yourself up over it. And that the orgasm is not like a flag that you have to hoist. The orgasm is a wonderful byproduct of sex. It can come in many different ways. And it's not necessarily something that happens at the end of um, a particular set of acts. Have I missed anything out, Anvita? Yeah, just this idea that these expectations, rules, criteria, we have no idea who's made them how, and why they made them and what they are. So, you know, they become like, they've become written in stone and they're not written in stone. There are no, these are mostly myths. They do not exist. So don't hold on to them so tightly that, you know, they actually cause problems in your sexual life. Let them go, they're myths. Absolutely, because as we said that, you know, people think of the Kama Sutra as the ultimate book on sex and the Kama Sutra at no point talks about penetration. It doesn't even talk about that. On the other hand, the Chinese texts do talk about it. So everybody has a different idea. Enjoy what you are doing. Don't judge yourself. And just this idea, we understand that you are going to feel anxiety for something or the other. It's only human to do so. But if you actually get into the pleasure part of it, if you let your mind focus on that, you'll find that the anxiety becomes less and less because you're thinking less about self-judgment. Let that be before you begin. Don't let that be part of the act. Absolutely, totally. Focus on the pleasure, yeah. So as always, do comment, like, subscribe on the video. If you have any further questions, I am on info.seema.anand at gmail.com. And if you need any personal help or therapy, Anvita can be reached on anvitamadanbehel.com. We'll see you here next week. Until next time.